is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Africa is the world's youngest continent. 60% of the continent's population is under 30 years of age. And that is why the theme of the 29th African Union Summit is harnessing the demographic dividend through investing in the youth. The African Union hopes that by investing in its young people, it will secure the continent's future. So how does the continental body hope to turn this rhetoric into development? And what are the other outcomes of the African Union Summit? From the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. The African Union believes educating the youth should be given a priority for the young in the continent can make conscious political decisions during elections. At the same time, the AU says education helps the youth to involve effectively in democratization and nation building. We believe that uh, emphasis needs to be placed on education to ensure that youth have access to school, that they can stay in school, and that they can make political choices that are uh, well informed. Since the adoption of AU Charter on Elections and Governance, the African Union believes its efforts in democratizing elections in African states and making them fair and equitable are bearing fruit. A majority of our countries used to run elections through government ministries. And the Charter has brought in a new culture, political culture, where government has been asked to, you know, kind of uh, give up this responsibility to an independent institution. So almost all our 55 member states, almost all of them, now have these independent bodies in charge of elections. The participation of the youth in observer missions during elections in governance and opening more political space for the women and youth in Africa is what the continental body is aspiring to practically see inside the political system of the 55 member states of the African Union. We want youth to be involved in observer missions, in governance, in participation of the youth, in this new governance or democratic governance that we call it uh, we are looking at the shared values throughout the african continent and how the youth can play a role the au believes democracy peace and development cannot be the preserve of the state alone these three major imperatives for continental unity and integration in Africa should be the joint responsibility of the state, civil society and the private sector working in concert. Many argue, based on the current political landscape, this definitely takes significant amount of time before it becomes a reality in most states in Africa. Group Tala CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Deputy Chair, thank you very much for your time. I want to start by looking at the theme for this year's African Union Summit, which is harnessing the demographic dividend of, uh, through investment in the youth. First of all, why that theme? You know, Africa is endowed with human resources. Our youth, we have the greatest number of youth now. Even this proportion, this population is going to double or triple in 20 years' time. So we have at our disposal a very large population of young people. Now, young people have a lot of energy, creative energy and intelligence. But if this energy is not channeled properly, it will become a crisis. But if we invest in our youth, that is to say we educate them, uh, you have a numerate and a literate Africa. You are creating the conditions for an educated population, a cultured population, which can imbibe technology and capital and finance and be on the road to industrialization. 
because industrialization basically is application of science and technology to production. Now, you cannot do that without an educated population. If an educated population, we are envisaging an African where every African child is in school. Can you imagine that? Where every African child is in school, every African child is studying. We are creating the conditions for Africa to become modern, mechanized, industrialized, and digitized. In our view, that is the only way that Africa can begin to add value to its good, begin to process and industrialize. Industrialization is based basically on science and technology, and that's education. So for us, the theme of this year is very appropriate, and it's good that Africa is beginning to look at her sons and daughters, her, her natural resources, her most natural resources, its people are the most critical who can add value more than gold, silver, oil. How do you see this though as, a, as critical or as central in realizing uh, Africa's economic transformation? It is through an educated population we can imbibe technology, we can add vocal process that you begin now to raise the standard of living of our people. Without that, we shall forever be producing cocoa or gold or silver or whatever without processing. Is the the processing aspect that has value, and that is based on science and technology, that is based on education. I have lived in a country where education was free and compulsory for everybody, and I'm amazed at what they've been able to achieve. So this, this uh, theme, though, has four pillars, mm -hmm. education, health, mm -hmm. uh, governance, and employment. Mm -hmm. Give me a brief overview about they those four central themes. They are interconnected. An educated population is likely to be a healthy population. An educated population is going to demand good governance from its leaders. Because their eyes are open, and if you don't do well, they throw you out. An educated population will not only take jobs, will also provide jobs. You, 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 you are developing graduates who are able to be self-employed, they can employ people. So educated population, education really is the master key for Africa. If you recall, in the days of slavery, it was an act of subversion punishable by death to teach a slave to read and, to read and write. Why do you think it was so important to keep slaves ignorant? Because the moment you can read and write, the moment your eyes are open, you are not a slave anymore. Because war and peace and development starts from the mind. And it's the human mind that you forge development and peace and security. So education, developing of the human material, which we have in abundance, is the key for us in Africa. And of course, we're going to, you're going to have to assist uh, countries to domesticate uh, uh, these four pillars. How are you going to assist uh, the member states, though, to move forward in terms of implementation of this? You know, the African Union is steadily acquiring more gravitas. People are listening more. They begin to see that integration in Africa is not just a pipe dream. They begin to see the effects. They begin to see the benefits of more intra-African trade. And if you take your mind back to 1884, 85, that was when the European powers got together and cut Africa up like a piece of cake, King Leopold. So he wanted a piece of that magnificent African cake. But that is our home. We are Africans. Africa is our home. Some poor thing is a piece of cake to be cut up. The whole business of the African Union is trying to disentangle these knots that were tied together. That's why we had to go through liberation, through the OAU. Now that we've won our final liberation with South Africa, we're not seeking to integrate the continent so that our children, our children's children can walk and travel and go to school anywhere they want. And Africans can begin to see each other as one integral family. This integrity, which was disrupted and ruptured in 1884-85 by Europeans seeking profits, that's what it's about. So that the whole business of the African Union trying to put this thing back together again. A final comment from you, Deputy Chair, because at the end of, of this summit, of course, you're, mm -hmm. you're looking forward to some uh, outcomes uh, mm -hmm. from the deliberations. Mm -hmm. What are those outcomes we, that you'll be looking forward to? We're hoping that the consensus on the importance of harnessing the democratic dividends, basically educating all our people, will be agreed on and it become an African agenda, pan-African-wide agenda. And 
each African state will have to pursue it in its constituency. Uh -huh. In Kenya, they're trying to have, you already have it. In Ghana, we already have it. In South Africa, if you have every African child educated, it is possible, then together we can see the continent move up. Without that, you can forget about development. Deputy Chair, thank you very much. Pleasure. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. Business in Africa is high risk. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchio Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Well, the theme of this year's summit is harnessing the demographic dividend through investment in the youth. And to shed more light uh, to this debate, I'm now joined by expert guests. Dr. Solomon Derso is the founding director of the Amani Africa Research. Welcome to the program. And Professor Emmanuel Nadozia is the executive secretary of the African Capacity Building Foundation. Thank you very much, gentlemen, Thank for you. joining us in this discussion. Uh, Professor Nadozia, start yes. off with you. Sure. Harnessing the demographic dividend through investment in the youth. Why this theme? Well, I think uh, human beings in general are the most important asset that you can have in any country. And young people represent the, uh, the crux of that asset. So investing in your most valuable asset makes a lot of sense. And uh, this is why it is important for Africa to pay attention to the youth who is the future of this continent. And uh, also the fact that uh, youth unemployment is one of the, if not the major, the number one problem the continent is facing. So I think the theme is very appropriate. Of course, it's one thing to have a good theme, but it's another thing to actually make it happen in reality so that you can really empower the young people. Dr. Derso, do you think Africa is doing enough to invest in its youth? I think the issue of investing in youth is about uh, what uh, Professor Amina Mahmoud said in her speech just now. It's about building tomorrow today. Uh, and the issue of youth is one of the major issues for the future of this continent in all aspects of the lives of the people of the continent in peace and security, uh, political governance and, in, and in economic development. I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done from what we have seen from the Arab uprisings in North Africa to the various protests that we have witnessed across the continent. There is restlessness on the part of the youth for being the agents of change and being provided with the opportunities that enable them to unleash their potentials. And the economic growth narrative that we have heard hasn't provided them with the necessary opportunities in terms of getting skills, in terms of being part of the labor right. force of the uh, economic boom process, and in terms of also getting employment opportunities. Professor Nadozi, yes. we often hear that uh, you know the youth are the future. We, I mean, this is not the first time that, that Africa is talking about its youth empowerment, investment uh, for its youth. And this has been called a roadmap by the African Union. How really is it a roadmap and how exactly is this going to be implemented? Well, uh, I think if you see the four pillars of this uh, roadmap, you will see that there's uh, at least an understanding of what needs to, uh, to happen uh, in, in education, in health, in good governance and in uh, employment. Uh, so those are critical areas. Uh, but my worry is that, as you rightly pointed out, uh, there has been so much talk about this, 
And my concern is that I don't see the African leaders having the sense of urgency that is, that need, that's needed to really address this critical challenge, this number one challenge that Africa is facing. You know, uh, like uh, uh, you know, my, my, my co-panelist um, you know, said right now, making sure that uh, people are empowered by giving them the right education, and I've always maintained uh, people have to be educated so that they can be employable or self-employable. Uh, currently, the education system is not doing that. Number two is the skills that they need. You know, we're in the capacity building um, uh, you know, business, and we recognize that we have serious capacity gaps when it comes to critical technical skills. But if you look at the uh, university education, 80 to 90 percent are, are being enrolled in, uh, in, in, in arts, in, 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 in law, in in social sciences, but not in the area of science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So the skills are very important. The third one is uh, adequate health care, as we mentioned, and, and of course food security that will right. be enable people to really fulfill their, their, their lives. But we not need to tackle this thing so we stop all this migration of young people or the hopelessness that you see or them being vulnerable to be employed by the sort of people who don't want them to be employed, such as Boko Haram and the rest of them. Dr. Desha, are you seeing a sense of urgency from Africa's leadership? Because, of course, this is being called a milestone. I think it's a question of time. Uh, we either are alive to the realities on the ground and to the sense of restlessness and urgency and high expectation on the part of the youth. And if we don't heed the call for meeting those expectations, it is on our, to our own peril. And therefore, the question really is, I think it is a very timely agenda. Now, would African countries walk the talk? I think that's the crux of the matter. And in this regard, it is extremely important to take note of and recognize that the various areas that require to unleash the potentials of the use are interlinked. It's not just about economic uh, issues. It's also about governance issues. It's also about uh, health education. All of these need to be brought together and enable the use. Actually, the use do not require necessarily to be on the table. Mm -hmm. They may wish to actually redefine the whole table and not necessarily to come and sit on the table and discuss about on the same format. What we need is actually to reconfigure the whole economic narrative on the African continent by investing in the human capital and the human potential. Well, the, the question is going to be asked though, Professor Nadozi, the yes. question is going to be asked that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's growth has been rather slow over the last few years. So how are countries going to be able to meet this investment though if the economies are growing at a slower pace? Well, you know, uh, in my former job as the chief economist at the UN Economic Commission for Africa, I very strongly advocated for uh, structural transformation based on, on, on industrialization. Uh, because this is the way you can remove this excessive dependence on primary commodity exports. Because once the price falls, the growth you know, drops and employment is not there. And besides, uh, those are sectors that do not necessarily provide the jobs that we need to provide massively. You know, millions of jobs, you have to create about 10 million jobs every year to be able to absorb this uh, kind of uh, you know, youth population. So, uh, the fact that African countries have still, many of them, not been able to diversify their economies, not been able to bring about the transformation necessary and industrialization necessary and agricultural modernization that is important. It makes it, that's why this, you have the slow growth. And, and so on, unless this is tackled once and for all, and the African partners from outside also understand that yes, it's good to make investments in social areas, uh, but just like the Chinese are doing, helping to build infrastructure here, I think that's the, you know, the, the, the key to it, especially energy infrastructure, which is needed for industrialization to take place. So once this is done, uh, then I believe that uh, we can you know, spur growth, but it requires visionary leadership. It, uh, and I, I, I do believe that we have to bring the youth on, uh, to, to the discussion table as well to involve them in every facet of, uh, of, 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 the, of the dialogue. Right, Dr. Desu, you did mention earlier on that uh, we are trying to stop our youth from joining extremist, extremism and uh, insurgency groups, though. And, and, and one of the issues that's being discussed at the African Union 
is the issue of terrorism, the issue of extremism, and generally the, use, the issue of peace and security. The African Union Commission chair himself has talked about the issue in South Sudan, Somalia, uh, the, the, the Lake Chad Basin, and the Sahel region as Sahel. being issue. What's going to happen now? Is this going to be continuous talk, or is something happening to stem that situation? The, this question is directly related to one of the uh, pillars of the 10-year uh, plan of the Agenda 2063 of the African Union. And this has to do with uh, silencing the guns by 2020. And these continuing uh, protracted issues affecting uh, these parts of the continent that you mentioned basically uh, draw attention to the fact that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And the response to this challenge of peace and security in these parts of Africa shouldn't just be security. Security, I think, these issues would miss a lot of the issues that are part of the equation. And that's why linking, linking it with the quest from the youth about employment, about education, about skills, about being able to network, connect, produce, and self employ All of these are extremely interlinked. And the whole issue of human rights, the whole issue of governance, they also form part and parcel of what need to be uh, done in terms of creating the necessary conditions for rolling back the right. expansion of uh, this uh, terrorism uh, menace that is affecting many parts of the continent. Right. Uh, uh, Professor, we, we've been talking now about uh, security issues, but South Sudan has been on fire since 2013. We're not seeing much impetus to try and stop that. Well, no, I, I, uh, um, this is a very unfortunate situation in South Sudan, uh, you know, a country that got independence with a whole lot of expectations and everybody was wishing that very young country all the best. For it to descend into the chaos that it is today is extremely sad and unfortunate. Uh, but I think a lot of effort is being committed to addressing the challenges, especially within the framework of the African Union. Uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, with, with the con renewed effort and with continued um, you know, aggressive effort that uh, we're going to be able to improve the situation in South Sudan. Uh, and, and of course, I urge all the parties concerned to really, uh, you know, look for once at the conditions of the, uh, the, the South Sudanese who are, who are suffering, you know, t tremendously and, and forget all the personality issues and all the, you know, ethnic tensions and look at the, the greater good and be able to come together on the table and find a lasting solution. And I also urge the leadership of the African Union, uh, uh, you know, because I'm very optimistic with the new chairperson of the commission, uh, who, you know, has had quite a, a lot of experience in right. peace and security and has really demonstrated that, that this is a, a priority of his. Where four, just four days after he was inaugurated, he had already gone to Somalia, to South Sudan and to the Sahel. And, you know, to really look at some of these issues in the first hand. And in his speech this morning, he pleaded with the African Society to really, you know, put a renewed effort and intensify their actions to yeah. address these problems. Are you seeing, though, Africa's leadership addressing the security challenges appropriately? I think it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, there are definitely uh, efforts that have been put into addressing uh, the peace and security challenges facing the country. But we have also seen lack of cohesion on the part of member states of the African Union, uh, lack of cohesion between the African Union level and uh, the level of uh, the regions. And that has enabled those in the conflict situation actually to play uh, between different uh, actors. And that, that has been the major issue. So the level of cohesion that you require in order to stem the level of violence uh, in South Sudan uh, has been lacking. And therefore, that has been one of the reasons why we didn't see the level of you know, uh, success in terms of the implementation of the peace process. I think it's also extremely important that uh, much of the focus has been to bring together the political elite and hammer out uh, a bargain between the political elite. Um, and that hasn't really delivered the expected level of result in terms of bringing about peace and security to South Sudan. And perhaps there is a need for also um, looking into and investing in the various sources of uh, building peace from the ground up. 
uh, looking into the work of religious leaders, looking into the work of traditional leaders, looking into community-based organizations for them to mobilize constituencies of peace in South Sudan that would push for uh, a successful peace settlement in South Sudan. So all of this though is leading down to uh, the African Union's Agenda 2063, silencing the guns by 2020, creating an investment that is viable for investment on the continent. In your final conclusions though, in terms of investing uh, in the youth and in terms of what you would like the African Union to do, how do you see all this panning out? Well, I, I think uh, um, the reform uh, agenda that is being um, tabled at this point in time, and President Paul Kagame of Rwanda presented his report this morning uh, in the closed session to the heads of states. I think that's a very, a, a very good sign, a move in the right direction, uh, because many of us who have been following the union and its, uh, you know, secretariat and, and its organs and 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 uh, and, 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 and units have recognized that there's a lot of dysfunction there but structurally, functionally speaking, and otherwise. And more importantly, the issue of financing the union. For once and for all, that African countries uh, need to demonstrate their ownership of the uh, union and the agenda uh, by really providing the, 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 the significant proportion of the funding of the, of the union. So for me, I'm optimistic at that level. Uh, so the agenda, the agenda on the table looks quite good. At least the RECs can now be the true building blocks of the African Union. Uh, but having a good plan and a good strategy is one thing, as I've maintained. Implementation is a difficult thing on the continent. Uh, the ACBF has committed to the African Union Commission to provide some capacity support, right. uh, and even some financing as well, for the implementation of this, uh, re these reforms. So we shall work together and make sure that uh, this happens, because that will unleash the potential of the continent to uh, achieve Agenda 2063. Dr. Desha, your final comments? Yeah, uh, I think... Uh, as they say, the test of the, the pudding in, in the 80s. I think what we need to see is really uh, African states walking the talk as far as harnessing the demographic the dividends uh, of, of, of the youth in Africa. Uh, and in this regard, I think uh, what we need to uh, look into is uh, what are the various uh, actors who take responsibility for the implementation of the various pillars of this roadmap on uh, the theme of this AU summit. What are the particular roles and responsibilities of member states? What are the roles and responsibilities of regional com communities? And what are the roles and responsibilities of the African Union itself? And of course, various sectors responsible for the implementation of the, very, the various pillars. What are the extent to which, for example, the education sector is part and parcel of this discussion? and also the process of the implementation of this agenda. Uh, the private sector, what role would the private sector play in this regard? What role intellectuals and civil society organizations would play, think tanks uh, would play in this regard? These are all issues that need also to be factored in and it's important that the African Union mobilize the support of various stakeholders across the African continent who would champion this agenda and therefore ensure uh, ownership and successful implementation of this agenda. Without that, I think, uh, I'm afraid that we may end up having the same kind of issue of discussing major agenda items and having good ideas and then leaving them here in Addis whenever we go back to our respective destinations across the continent. Uh -huh. I hope this time around we will not do that. And that is one of the reasons why institutions like mine are producing reports exactly identifying and highlighting all the issues for consideration. Dr. Solomon Derso, we leave it there for the moment, and Professor Emmanuel Nadozi to you both. Thank you very much for joining in this conversation. And that's all we have time for on Talk Africa this week. But do join us and follow this conversation on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. From the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, I'm Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.